appreciate this opportunity to share some of our results on benchmarks for grid energy management with Python Gecko. My name is John Hedengren. I'll be presenting the work of Nathaniel Gates, Daniel Hill, Blake Billings, Cody Powell, and myself. Energy systems are very complex, and so we're going to be talking today about these complex energy systems, how to solve them with Python Gecko uh, to optimize the operation, and in particular, six grid energy benchmarks. Some of the things that we're going to be doing with Python Gecko in the future, and then some conclusions. So first of all, energy systems are very complex. There are generation, many types, uh, solar, wind, other types of renewable energy that are coming online that are non-dispatchable. Uh, one of the ways that people have suggested to deal with these non-dispatchable energy systems is to use energy storage. But then we also have uh, demand that increases or decreases as there are weather systems or other things that we can forecast or predict. But we're limited with our conventional uh, power systems that are dispatchable by things like ramp rate. So we've developed six grid energy benchmarks uh, that include generation, energy storage, demand, and ramp rate. And in particular, we have the first one that includes just one generation, one demand. Uh, so for example, electricity, and then a ramp rate. Uh, for the second one, we have two generators. This would be like cogeneration, where you produce uh, electricity and steam and maybe two different demands for that electricity and steam, but you have a ramp rate on how fast you can ramp up or down the boiler that produces the electricity through the turbine or the waste heat that you'd use. We also have a third one with three generations and uh, three demands uh, with two producers that you can ramp up or down. So that might be something like uh, you know, solar that produces electricity, but also high temperature electrolysis to produce hydrogen. And then there might be some waste heat as well from that. All right, and then we have uh, energy storage. So number four, we introduce a, a storage. And then this is storage with a ramp rate that you can adjust up or down. And then the final one is cogeneration with two types of energy storage. Uh, and a ramp rate. So it becomes more complicated as you go. We have the source code to all of these if you'd like to access it. And uh, just come to this link right here that uh, is going to open up a web page. And that will give you the source code to all of these if you just like to uh, follow along with the source. And I'll be explaining these in a little bit more detail uh, where you can uh, get all of the source code there. All right, so first of all, a little bit about Gecko Optimization Suite. You can install with pip install Gecko, and it will install it to your computer and your Gecko and uh, your Python distribution. There are extensive uh, there's extensive documentation and read the docs. Also, many questions on Stack Overflow. So we appreciate the community that's out there. They're using it and giving helpful feedback, questions as well to build out some of the documentation. Also, it's downloaded about five uh, to 10,000 times per month. Some of the features of Gecko are that it's a blended physics-based and empirical model. Uh, there are gradient-based optimizers that can solve differential and algebraic equations or continuous or mixed integer optimization problems. Also, it uses automatic differentiation for the gradient-based optimizers. It includes some of the large-scale optimizers like APOPT, BPOPT, IPOPT, and some others. Basically, we're solving this type of optimization problem where we want to try to minimize an objective function subject to equality or inequality constraints. So this is just an example, this general optimization problem that we talked about. And here is the hock Schakowsky number 71 problem, just as an example where we have an objective function, an equality constraint, and an inequality constraint. And our variables are initialized this way with lower bound of 1 and upper bound of 5, and initial conditions right here. This is how we initialize the variables. 
we set up the equations and then we solve it with Gecko. But let's talk about these benchmark problems. So the first one is a production and demand. In this case, uh, something like a nuclear reactor where you can ramp up or down. In some cases, uh, there are just a couple nuclear plants that can do that. And, uh, and they're increasingly designing systems like small modular reactors that might be able to do that more to be able to follow some of the demand. But we're very limited in how fast we can follow that demand. Uh, so we're limited by this ramp rate. And so the very first optimization problem for grid optimization is adjusting this ramp rate. That becomes our decision variable. And we're trying to minimize this objective function that says don't violate the, uh, the demand shortage. Okay, that's worth 1,000. And uh, the demand oversupply, so if you produce more electricity than is needed, that's a 1 right there. So it's a 1,000 times more important to not undersupply, which might lead to brownouts or blackouts. And, uh, and also try to adjust this ramp rate to minimize the overproduction when possible. So in this case, we have uh, the, the symbols that are set up. And you can see the optimization problem that's uh, solved in Gecko. And, and what we're going to do, uh, I'll just highlight a couple things about this. Uh, you can see that the ramp rate goes to negative 1. It doesn't need as much electricity during this time. And the ramp rate comes up to 1 when it anticipates halfway through the day that it's going to uh, have some more supply that it needs later on. And so it starts ramping up here in order to be able to meet that supply later. So this is an example of a very simple optimization problem for grid energy, but it tests the ability of the optimizer to proactively adjust the ramp rate early on so it can meet a uh, target later. Let's go on to the next one. This is going to be problem number two, which is cogeneration. And this is common in places like refineries, or chemical plants uh, where you might produce electricity and steam anywhere where you have uh, some waste heat that you might be able to use it's, it's going to be particularly attractive uh, maybe power generation next to a district heating system which is often done in Scandinavia or other places that are very cold where it makes sense to run a district heating system so in this case uh, we have one producer that we can ramp up or down uh, but we're trying to produce to two things, demand one and demand two. That might be electricity and that might be heat. So there are two profiles here where you can see there's the first uh, demand and second demand. Uh, and you can see that uh, we have uh, the production stays well above that in order to be able to... Um, meet this demand later on. You can see here's where the heat is constrained. And so you're actually ramping up here. Even though you don't need as much electricity, you need more heat. And so we meet that demand here. OK, so this is the optimal profile of the rate, uh, the ramp rate for that energy system. Again, something that might be able to ramp up and down very slowly. All the times here are non-dimensionalized, just 0 to 1. But it could be over the course of a day, over the course of uh, you know a week or a month or a year, or, or something to that effect. Let's go on to the next one. We have uh, tri-generation now, where we have three things that we are producing, and we have two generators. So these, you know, solar with high temperature electrolysis to bring hydrogen. So maybe the third one is our hydrogen. We have production and demand maybe in the later part of the day. That's when all the vehicles need to recharge. And this might be electricity and heat. OK, so this could be something like for an automotive application uh, to be able to provide electricity, heat, and, uh, and the hydrogen. And you, you can see the two ramp rates that coordinate to meet these three demands. 
All right, let's go on to the next one. This would be energy storage. Now, this is a popular topic when thinking about homes and uh, maybe a battery pack or uh, things like in uh, cooling applications where you need to chill the load. So maybe this is a hot location where you can uh, maybe run the compressor overnight and be able to generate uh, some storage. So for example, here's some energy storage and then it's recovered maybe during the later parts of the day when electricity is more expensive and you can't uh, necessarily run the generator or you don't want to run the generator during this time. So we have this energy storage system and this is a case where we just have one production number that goes up or down in order to be able to meet this uh, energy demand uh, but we don't do any ramp rates here. The next one we introduce it with the ramp rate as well. So it's similar to the last one but now we can adjust uh, this energy system up or down, turn it on or off, uh, and it's going to be able to meet the demand and uh, with this generation and with this energy storage. So there are more things that it's coordinating here. And you can see that we have this subject to the differential and algebraic equations. And the way that Gecko solves this is through a simultaneous method where it solves the objective function and the differential and algebraic equations simultaneously through the use of orthogonal collocation on finite elements, where it transcribes those into algebraic equations and then solves both of them together with an efficient large-scale optimizer. I'll show a comparison of those two approaches after this uh, sixth one, cogeneration with dual storage. So this one, it's more complicated, but still small enough that it could be a benchmark problem. But it shows some of the coordination that's needed between these, uh, the producers and the energy storage. You got two energy storage uh, devices, maybe like hydrogen storage and a battery. And then uh, this might be your generation here, the ramp rate on your generation. Okay, so the solution scale up. One of the important things is that when we tried two different methods, a sequential method where we solved the equations and the objective function sequentially, iterating back and forth between those, um, it helps to reduce the, the uh, variable space that you need for the optimizer, but you sequentially solve these equations, the constraints, uh, over and over again to machine precision uh, unnecessarily. And so one of the things that we've seen with this in these benchmark cases is that if we solve it simultaneously, we get uh, this linear scale up uh, between number of time steps. That's our problem size versus the solve time. And so we get uh, effectively a, almost a linear scale up for these benchmark problems. The ones that are more complicated, like five and six, uh, we don't s quite see the linear scale up. But in all cases, uh, we see an improvement over the sequential method. So interestingly enough, uh, with just a few number of time steps, you have very few number of decision variables, it can get it in you know, one iteration of the sequential, but later on you see if you increase the problem size and have more degrees of freedom, uh, it takes more iterations of that, and so you, you see longer solve times with the sequential approach. Let me talk about uh, briefly an experimental benchmark. This is going to be a later one where we have uh, some energy storage here in this uh, little device, a temperature control lab. So this one's coming. We're going to demonstrate model predictive control and how we can not just do a grid energy study, but how we can re-optimize. So there are going to be forecasts that are going to need to be updated. We can use that prior information uh, and estimate using the, the measurements to update our model and then be able to predict forward in time. Uh, we can also learn and optimize at the same time with something like moving horizon estimation that then transfers parameters to a model predictive controller. So let's talk about some challenges and opportunities. The opportunities 
with this type of uh, grid energy optimization are that we can use uh, data-based modeling, not just physics-based models. Uh, and we have seen a big improvement in optimizers over the last 30 years with a 2.5 billion times faster due to Moore's law and optimizer improvements. We want to start using more machine learning and so this package Python Gecko is integrating uh, more machine learning concepts to be able to handle large data sets and combine those with physics based models. So we have things like physics based models that we can use and we want to be able to use those effectively with the data. Uh, and so there's several strategies that we can use such as uh, provide simulators to create training data all the way down to this uh, meshed or uh, combined approach where we combine the fundamental uh, capabilities of machine learning and physics-based uh, modeling with optimizers. So we're working on this physics-based uh, machine learning. This is just an example using a gecko brain. Uh, so more work will be coming on this where we can use different types of activation functions to be able to express physics-based solutions. So in conclusion, I'd just like to share that we uh, grid energy systems are complex. We've proposed six grid energy benchmarks with dispatch optimization, cogeneration, tri-generation, and then energy storage, load following the storage, and cogeneration with dual storage. We saw an improvement with a simultaneous solution method. And there are many challenges and opportunities remaining. Uh, we're working on improving the algorithms and putting them into this package and others in Python to make them accessible, and particularly working on hybrid machine learning.